Uh, this has been a long time coming, okay, that I wanted to talk to you. You're an activist. You're a follower of Jesus, right? Amen. Yeah. Okay. So, and I mean, there's a lot of maybe controversy when it comes to those two topics together, especially here in America. And I'm saying that as a Latino even. Okay. <laughs> so we'll tap a little bit into, you know, the type of work you're doing and what makes you angry these days. So let's start right there. You know, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for being on the show. And can you tell us a little bit about the type of work you do? Oh, man. Yeah. Well, I, I, I like that there's a place in scriptures where it says we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling. So mm. I, I'm still working it out, man. But I, I'm a been in Philadelphia on the north side for 25 years. We're doing all kinds of stuff. We're painting murals. We're turning abandoned houses into homes. We're uh, doing work around gun violence. So that's all, it's all kind of like intersects with each other, but we've been building a community here for over 20 years now. And it's a place I love to call home. Wow. Okay. So you've been painting murals and fighting gun violence, you said? Yeah, yeah. Okay. How do you do that? How do you go about that as a Christian, especially when there's, <laughs> this is my take, right? I, I see a lot of Christians who are in favor Uh, do you wrestle with any Christians that are like, why are you doing that? Well, first of all, I mean, the backdrop for me, which is important, is that I grew up in the Bible Belt. I grew up down south in East Tennessee. So I grew up with guns and my dad was in the military. I, I grew up hunting with my family. So I was very comfortable with guns. I had also become very accustomed to this kind of God and country, God, guns and country, you know, thing. And then the deeper I leaned into Jesus and took my faith seriously, the more I found myself troubled by many of those things. And in particular, you know, when I moved into North Philly, we're seeing one life after another cut short by gun violence. And I think that matters to God. You know, I think every person is made in the image of God and I don't think we can save every life, but I think we can do something about it. But I like to be creative, you know, so I got really taken by this image in scripture where it says in Micah and Isaiah, the prophets, they talk about a world where we beat our swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks. So we're like, man, that's that's a great vision. We don't have a lot of swords, but we've got a whole lot of guns in America. We've got more guns than people. So we invited people to voluntarily surrender their guns. And this is 10 years ago, man. We, we've got hundreds and hundreds, thousands of guns that we melt down. I know a lot of people are listening to this, but this is a shovel that I've got in my hand made out of a gun. So we turn the metal of the barrels into shovels and mattocks and garden tools. And then we turn the handles out of the wood stock. So it's literally, I tell my evangelical friends, Beto, like this is what a gun looks like when it gets born again. Wow. And so, like every time we make one, we're declaring that all things can be made new. And just as a gun can be repurposed, we can reimagine the world. We can reimagine our neighborhoods and even people, you know, people that have been perpetrators of violence are more than the worst thing they've ever done. So we believe that the grace of God's big enough to transform even a human heart, even someone who's taken another person's life. Wow. That's deep. Because I know, you know, part of the work you do is also in regards to uh, the death penalty, for example, and activism around, you know, war and especially, you know, what's going on in Gaza, which I, I just want to say, you know, kind of like put it on the table. I'm really unfamiliar. You know, I'm just like a Mexican guy who's living a, a regular, very regular uh, daily routine here in Costa Mesa. Uh, So I'm, I'm really disconnected to things that happen around the world other than, you know, like social media and yeah. maybe activists like you, you know, that that post what's going on, you know. So I don't you know. Don't take me as the authority on anything going abroad. But uh, but I, I kind of see what is happening here, maybe politically and ideologically in America. And maybe part of the reason which you know, I wanted to talk to you is because. I'm Latino and I know that a lot of things that happen in America start having effects around the world, you know? So 
like you know activism around like especially in the church right like the church uh let's say you know talking to lgbtq um, communities and things like that it starts reflecting on how the church does ministry in mexico in latin america and other places you know so all that to say the type of work you're doing impacts right and the type of work you're doing is around these issues that are important and sometimes maybe controversial, but how do you go about, for example, as we're talking about guns and turning them into shovels that are, you know, maybe serve a entire different purpose and get redeemed in a nation like America, where like, do you see war as just something bad? Like, should there be no soldiers? Maybe no guns. Is there a way to even defend yourself as a country uh, without this type of power? Well, I, I mean, these are awesome and deep and ancient questions in some ways, right? Like they're mm. we're, we're we're asking them in a in our own context. But some of these questions, you know, folks have been wrestling with for thousands of years. So I I I kind of think it's helpful to have a framework around these, that these are not just single issues, you know, the death penalty, gun violence, war, but I, I would invite us to embrace a, a, a big framework that says every person is made in the image of God and life is sacred and anything that crushes a human life crushes the image of God. So that like affects so many different things. And that's so important because, you know, for me growing up in the Bible Belt in Tennessee, we use language like pro-life, I'm pro-life, but we had so narrowly defined what that meant really to one issue on abortion that we ignored so many other issues that affect life and death. Uh, and that's what became really problematic for me was this kind of single issue stuff, man. So, you know, we would be more accurate to say that we were anti-abortion or we were pro-birth but not pro-life because once the baby was born, <laughs> you know, we kind of abandoned it. And so I want to like expand that advocacy for life. And that's why, you know, for me, a lot of my life, I was for the death penalty, but I started looking at the gospel. Uh, and when Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. I looked at Jesus interrupting an execution in the gospel and saying, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone, you know, this idea that we're all kind of equally sacred and equally broken, and that doesn't give us a right to judge or condemn another person. So uh, I believe that the, the death penalty is a direct betrayal, you know, a contradiction of the good news of Jesus, which is that there's a God that came to save broken people. Uh, and on gun violence, uh, there's a lot of people that say it's not a gun problem, it's a heart problem or it's a sin problem, you know? And I like to say it can be both. God heals hearts and we change laws. And Martin Luther King was a really great voice on that. One of the things he said is, a law cannot make a man love me, but it can make it harder for them to kill me. And so we need to make it harder for people to kill. And right now, I think we're making it really, really easy with almost no regulations and restrictions on guns. And, uh, you know, two thirds of Americans live without guns, choose to live unarmed. And yet we've got more guns than people. We're losing lives at over 100 a day lost to guns. Uh, it's the number one cause of death of children in America is gun violence. So you can't wow. say you're pro-life and ignore gun violence. So, and I want to be consistent with that. That's why I care about Gaza. I, I care about war and militarism is because I believe every person's sacred. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I want to say thank you for the type of work you're doing. And at the same time, uh, this is just kind of like putting the things on the table from talking to so many people on the show but I, I feel like I want to affirm you on what you're doing, right? So that's great. But I have also affirmed people who are almost like on the opposite spectrum, uh, maybe ideology. And so how do you wrestle with that? Have you been pressed on by even other Christians? And I know you have, right? But how do you deal with that? Because sometimes I, I'm like, I think you are both doing the work. Uh, and I don't necessarily know, you know, maybe this is not like a Peter versus Paul, you know, kind of like coming, um, 
at odds with each other because of the ministry they're doing. They're both doing, you know, what God called them to do. But, you know, do you have to come to, a, what is it called, to an agreement with other Christians? Or are you just like going all in with the ministry that you've been called? Do you care about other Christians maybe like pressing on you? And uh, maybe criticizing you and saying, "Hey, Shane, you know you're you're woke," for example, you know, or things like that. Uh, how do you deal with that? Maybe controversy or criticism. Well, the, the interesting thing is, like, I'm I, I, I'm not really um, trying to get people to to do w what I do or to follow me. I I want us all to take Jesus more seriously, right? To, to read the Sermon on the Mount, to read the Beatitudes in the gospel where Jesus blesses the poor and the merciful and the peacemakers and say, what does that mean for us, right? So the, you know, the movement that I'm a part of is called Red Letter Christians because we get our name from the Bibles that have the words of Jesus highlighted in red. And I believe the whole Bible matters. I believe, believe it's the, you know, the authoritative word of God. But I also believe that something unique and beautiful happens in Jesus, that the word takes on flesh, that we have is what scriptures calls the full revelation of God's love. We see God with skin on. And that's why Jesus is my hermeneutic, to use a fancy seminary word, right? Like Jesus is the lens through which I understand the Bible and, for, and I'm trying to interpret the world that I live in. And so when I look at Jesus saying, love your enemy, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, right? He's saying, when you live by the sword, you die by the sword. I think he's teaching us another way to live than the patterns of violence. And the sad thing is I read about and researched a lot of this, you know, I've written book, I read a, wrote a book on the death penalty and on gun violence. But then my recent book, Rethinking Life, is trying to put the, you know, connect the dots of these different issues. But one of the things that's so tragic, Beto, is that Christians are the biggest supporters of the death penalty in America. Literally, the death penalty wouldn't stand a chance without the support of Christians. And that becomes really problematic because that's not just a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. It, it really has deep ramifications on the gospel. Like, do we really believe that anybody's beyond redemption? And the same mm. with guns. Like, Christians are the biggest gun owners in America, the biggest gun enthusiasts in, in, in our country. They own guns at a higher rate than the general population. So... This is not just an issue to debate, but I think it's a deep theological and spiritual crisis in the church, because I think when Jesus said, love your enemies, he meant we shouldn't kill them, you know, that we like can't hold the cross in one hand and a weapon in the other. That becomes really irreconcilable to justify violence and still try to follow the Prince of Peace. That's why I think we need to be consistent at speaking out against all violence, whether it's an execution or gun violence or uh, the violence that's happening in Gaza right now. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So that makes you, is that kind of like what makes you angry these days? Well, I, I it makes me grieve. Like I think of Jesus, mm. like weeping over Jerusalem because they didn't mm. know the things that would bring peace. Um, but it also, I remember Jesus flipped tables you know, uh, there was a holy anger. But here's what's interesting. Jesus flipped tables in the temple. And it was religious people who were exploiting people and abusing them with their own faith. So like Jesus's harshest words are not for people on the fringes of the faith, but it was for the religious folk at the center of the faith who were, as in his words, a brood of vipers, right? They were uh, hurting people. He even said, uh, you know, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. He mm. said that to the teachers of the law and the religious folks. <laughs> wow. So we wonder what got him in trouble. It was that kind of thing. That's, that's really profound. Yes. Uh, no, Jerusalem, the temple, the religious leaders, I mean, that resonates a lot with me because, I mean, I love reading the Bible. I love scripture. I love uh, getting to know Jesus more. And I do see like this 
difference i would say between maybe christianity and following jesus and maybe yeah. maybe I, i'm just talking about america right because it's where i've been in the last 20 years and that was one of the purposes of the show you know christian podcast is like i know that uh christian doesn't equate jesus or following jesus necessarily but at least this is the to me the introductory theme to start talking about Jesus, you know? So sometimes we talk about Christianity like broad, but that's really profound because in a sense you're saying, you know, Christians in America are a brood of vipers, <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, I'm putting words into your mouth, but it, like, how do you... Here's the thing. You're not yeah. putting words in my mouth. That, those are mm. the words of Jesus. In fact, he even, I, I don't know that I could say this. Jesus said to the religious folks, you go across land and sea to make a single convert, but then you make them twice the sons of hell that you are. I mean, that's what he was saying to the religious folks. So I think you're right. Like this is something that's really deeply problematic because we have competing versions of Christianity. Mm. One of them looks and sounds like Jesus and another one doesn't. And the word Christian means Christ-like. So I would suggest if it doesn't look like Christ, if it doesn't liberate like Jesus, if it doesn't um, set the oppressed free, if it isn't good news to the poor, then it's not the gospel of Jesus. And there's a lot of things that are trying to camouflage themselves as Christianity, but they don't sound like Jesus. Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi was asked about Christianity and he said, I love Jesus. I just wish the Christians acted more like him. You know, and Frederick Douglass, the great abolitionist, and, uh, you know, he, he said, between the Christianity of Christ and the Christianity of America, I see the widest possible difference. You can't embrace one without denouncing the other. And he said, that's why I love and embrace the Christianity of Christ. And that's mm -hmm. the danger, Beto, I would say in America, especially, is it's like everything's branded Christian. Even our money, right, says in God we trust. But our economy looks like the seven deadly sins. <laughs> you know? mm. and what, and it, it's almost like you get inoculated, right? Where, where everything is Christian, nothing is Christian in essence, because we lose the centering of Jesus. So I think that's why it's so important to keep circling back to Jesus. And mm -hmm. that becomes really problematic with the death penalty or gun violence or defending what's happening in Gaza, is as you read Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, you see how countercultural it is, even how he talks about possessions, right? That we're to give everything we have to the poor. I mean, this is a call to live in an upside down way, to live in a way that, that's radically different from the dominant cultural values that we live in. Mm -hmm. And it seems like we have, uh, America is interesting, right? I, again, I'm Mexican. I come from Guadalajara and I've been here 20 years and so check this out. Yesterday, we're um, or maybe two days ago. Anyways, uh, I was talking to some friends and my pastor, and one of my friends says, "Yeah, I, I would love to see Beto in um, uh, where we're gonna call like a leadership master class." But he said he used this phrase that was really interesting, and <laughs> I kind of know it's true, but being hearing it from somebody else to me felt weird. But he said. I would love to see him in that master class because he's a minority. Mm. And uh, that was just so interesting. Like, okay, I'm a minority. What does that mean? And I kind of get it, right? I mean, America has minorities and uh, marginalized and things like that. And for sure, I could, I could fit some of those descriptors. And I'm not going to go into details, you know, but uh, for sure, I fit some of those like, okay, I'm a minority. But at the same time, I feel like... Oh, I, I don't want to, I know something resonates with me with that phrase, but I also feel like that's, that's not who I am. You know, like I'm following Jesus and you know, if God is with me, like who can be against me, right? Like, oh, <laughs> and, man. and I feel like God is way bigger than these phrases. Maybe we use upon each other or these, you know, political stances and things like that. But at the same time, I feel like if, even the type of work you're do, doing, um, you're, you're fighting against, in a sense, like systems, right? So I, I know there's truth to that, you know, I know there's systemic this and systemic that, 
uh, because that's that's how that's what humans created. You know, we we kind of like invented laws, and that's a system, right? The way we go about our laws, and that's why you know we have this thing with you know the Second Amendment, and like yeah, it's in the law, but <laughs> you know the, we we kind of created the Constitution, or Americans created the Constitution, and it's in a sense, you know, it's it's still up for debate or for change right yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. why you have amendments and you, you have uh you know people changing laws and you know trying to bring about change but anyways all that aside that's just kind of like bringing myself into the story and why this is relevant yeah, for man. me and the creating a christian brand is so interesting because again like america i feel like man like part of me wishes america the best in the in the christian sense you know because i do see america kind of like almost as the the last standing ground for christianity like if america would be just say okay let's just follow jesus be unafraid i'm like okay we would probably have some sort of like communist version of government and christians live in maybe persecution you know kind of like what you see in china or other places so not that it worries me, because I feel like that's probably what we need for you know, for revival to happen, because it's happening in other places, and persecution is happening in other places, and people are coming to Christ in other places under persecution. That's a real thing. But on the other hand, it's like, it, wow, is America really like the, the final guardian of Christianity, right? That we are so afraid that we need to, you know, say, like, you're saying that Christians are the the number one gun owners in America, and why is that? Because they're afraid of what of you know the government taking and uh, you know overreaching into maybe their belief system. But you have a way almost like contradictory uh, way of life in Jesus. Like that's that's the part where I'm I'm kind of like at odds too, you know. But at the same time, I feel like an outsider in America, and I think. I say all of that because I want to be a faithful follower of Jesus. Yeah, man. Right? In a country that I feel like, man, like, how do I do it? I consider myself almost like a missionary in America. And I feel like that's why God has given me this, this background of, okay, I'm Latino, um, undocumented, uh, you know, love media, love to be on, on, on social media, love the cameras, love to talk to my Latino fellows. But I know that like I speak English, you know, and I have an accent, but I, I love talking to people who have books, who you know write theology stuff. And so that's where I'm like, uh, there's a debate in my head. You know, I'm like, how can I be a faithful follower of Jesus? I have I have had, like I said, I have had voices on this show where, you know, there's people that are like pro gun you know, or like pro maybe Trump, you know, which is, I mean, some other Christians are like, how can you, you know, follow Trump and be a Christian? And there's other Christians that are like, how can you be a, a Christian and, and be uh, on the opposite end? Right. So it's yeah. like, man, I just want to be faithful to Jesus. So help me out, man. <laughs> what? Well, I, you know, I, I would say you named something really well when, when you said like, uh, you know, some of this stuff is about principalities and powers. As you know, Ephesians says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And and it also says like the authorities in high places. So I think in some of those things, they have hold in the highest parts of our government. And even in our history, you know, you kind of name the fact that America is a paradox. We have these aspirations mm. like all men are created equal. And yet the people who wrote that owned human beings and sold them as property. You know, George Washington had uh, uh, teeth that were pulled from enslaved people. Like the, there were some, even in the language of the founding documents, we called Native American savages. We said that black folks are three fifths human. They're partly count, you know, and that's why, like, I look at at history and uh, it was Eddie Glaude that said America is not unique in her sins of slavery, you know, colonization, mm -hmm. but America is unique in the mythology 
that we tell ourselves to justify those sins. And we've created a theology of manifest destiny, of American exceptionalism, the doctrine of discovery, right? These things that are like create a kind of spiritual imagination and a holiness of America, that this is like God's messianic force in the world. And I think that's a danger. That's where, you know, nationalism begins to conflate, you know, begins to, um, replace Jesus as the Messiah. Because the Bible doesn't say God so loved America. It said God so loved the world. And mm -hmm. Jesus didn't speak English. Jesus wasn't white. <laughs> the national anthem was not an, uh, a worship song, right? Like that, that we've got to name the fact that there are different competing narratives here. So I think you do so good at that. And some of this is in real time, right? Donald Trump is not just about Trump. It's about principalities and powers that have been unleashed, that are showing the worst fears and racism and xenophobia in our country. Many people, when they say make America great again, let's not fool ourselves. They mean make America white again. And it is about <laughs> making sure people what? like uh, you know that you're minorities and that this is a white country and a Christian nation. And if you're not OK with that, then we'll keep we'll you can go back where you came from. Like this is this is really deep. So I think we've got to really name that and then say, what does Jesus have to say? And boy, I, I won't preach long, Beto, I promise. But like I want to <laughs> say, you know, that what happened in Jesus. Is the most profound act of divine solidarity that mm -hmm. the world has ever seen, that God left all the comfort of heaven to be born homeless in a manger in with brown skin as a Palestinian, Jewish, refugee baby in the middle of a genocide, died executed on a cross uh, to expose all of that violence and subvert it with love and forgiveness in an empty tomb. So I think that's good news, right? That I mean, even when Jesus is being crucified, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That that's so deep, man. I mean, to think that like God felt the absence of God, God felt abandoned by God. So why is that good news? It's good news because there's tons of little kids and families in Gaza that are wondering where God is right now. And as my friend Munther Isaac, you know, Palestinian theologian said, God is under the rubble. God is with all of those who are suffering. And that's good news for all of us. I think it's disturbing news for people who are wealthy and in power. It's an invitation to join God in the suffering. But that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's a gospel that is good news to the poor. It is liberating to the oppressed. It is open to everyone. But you got to leave some stuff and let go of the power in order to follow Jesus. Ooh. Man, it's so good. You know, I'm I'm having so many uh, little glimpses of um, just helping. It's you're helping my imagination, you know. So by saying America is a paradox, and like I said, you know, what I want to do is like faithfully follow Jesus in this country. And I feel like that's I'm part of the paradox, right? Mm. <laughs> that you have uh, maybe like a minority person and und undocumented. And I'm going to do my part. You know, I feel like on today's, if I would maybe have my takeaway of this conversation to me is God put a passion in me. And the passion is, you know, like for media and, and cameras and microphones and uh, this sort of stuff. But my biggest passion is to follow Jesus and follow him faithfully. And I feel like my calling right now is lean into the paradox, right? Like mm. I'd say, and it's... It, it's it's a little bit unresolved, but lean into it, you know? And I kind of love that idea because I've always thought, man, it's just God, like, God is so paradoxical. Like everything in, in scripture is like, okay, there's this, like there's, uh, I always say there's a, what do you say, um, orthodoxy or autopraxy. And I feel yeah. like Jesus always combines the two, you know, like he's not just teaching, he's also doing. And so, okay, lean into the paradox. I love it, man. That's so helpful. This is what we're going to do. We're going to bring yeah, up yeah. our emojis and <laughs> boom. <laughs> so we're going to either summarize the episode of Think of the Future by walking through our five emojis. 
Okay, so I call this the belief-o-meter, where we go from blasphemous to divine. So according to you, we're gonna start with blasphemous. Ooh. What is the worst idea out there? The most blasphemous you can think of. Oh, violence can bring peace. Ooh. Skeptical emoji. Where do you see skepticism or why are you still skeptical of? Oh. I am still skeptical that we can believe in Jesus and worship Jesus without following him. Mm. So good. Inspire emoji. Where do you see inspiration or what gives you hope? Right now, uh, my Palestinian Christian friends, pastors and theologians, uh, they've given me so much hope, even in the middle of, of terrible, terrible uh, occupation and violence. Wow. Holy emoji. Um, things get better, right? So what is a holy idea according to Shane Claiborne? Hmm. I think of the words of this uh, mother that had just lost her, her little boy to gun violence. And she said, at least there's a God who understands my pain, a God who knows what it feels like to lose a child. To me, that's holy. It transcends even the, the best theology I had at Princeton Seminary. Wow. And the final emoji is the divine emoji. So what is the highest idea you can think of maybe even as you think of the future um, or whatever you know what is the highest idea you can think of Jesus is God with skin on love made flesh the full manifestation of God's love on display or at Beto as one of my neighbors said uh, God cone carne when you order your burrito cone carne it means with meat and we have in the incarnation is God with meat. So I, I, Jesus is the most profound divine thought and uh, reality that I know. Beautiful. And with that burrito analogy, <laughs> you have won over all the Latinos listening to this. <laughs> uh, so good. Okay. So to wrap up the episode, you have a lot of work you're doing. Uh, you have red letter Christians. You have, you're have author of many books. Where can people follow you? What's a good place where they can you know, get to know you more? Yeah, I'm on most of the socials. It's just my name and uh, Shane Claiborne on all the socials. But folks, we, we would love for you to find a spiritual home among Red Letter Christians. So check it out, redletterchristians.org. There it is, okay? Well, thank you, my friends, for watching, maybe listening. If you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, would love if you would subscribe, like, share this episode with a friend. Visit us at christianpodcast.com for way more episodes and videos like this one and conversations on theology, on God, on Jesus. And I think that's my hope that maybe, I don't know if one day, but <laughs> that we make Christian about Jesus again. <laughs> See you guys on the next one.